Tom, before I begin, I want to say it is indeed an honor to share this opportunity with you and the people of Mobile. As I come to you today, I would like to reflect with you on that first reading and talk to you about running the race. Running the race. Anyone serving and living in the black community knows that we are in a Christian race where black faith matters. And if the Christian life is a race, my question to all of us gathered here, are you really running this race? Our generation is a generation that loves sports. And if the Apostle Paul were alive today, he wouldn't, no doubt, read the sports pages of the newspaper and follow the progress of various teams and athletes. Those who are familiar with the epistles of the Apostle Paul are fully aware of his frequent use of athletic illustrations and references in his writings. He referred to boxing, and wrestling, running, and racing. However, the writer of Hebrews, not the Apostle Paul, writes to a group of persecuted, trampled, discouraged Hebraic believers to encourage them to keep moving forward on this Christian journey. Now, being victorious in a race is basic to being victorious in our Christian life. So on this fourth day of November 2017, at the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception here in Mobile, Alabama, as we celebrate Black Catholic History Month, I want us to look at some of those essentials to a victorious Christian life, as well as running this race victoriously. Are you with me? Say yes, Bishop. Yes. Stay with me. First, first, faith is required. Notice the Hebraic writer says that we that are in this race are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Who are these witnesses? These witnesses are those who have come before us, have run their race, and have completed it. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. They are examples to us as to how to successfully and victoriously run this race. We find many of them listed in Hebrews chapter 11, referred to as the Hall of Faith. Sometimes we need a reason for doing things, and we need encouragement while we are doing them. One of the greatest inspirations and comforts should be all the believers from the past, who have gone before us, who, have, who are all creatures of inspiration. So 
that we can continue to draw strength from them. So if you don't mind this morning, let me name some of the black saints for you, because black faith matters. Scriptures tell us that first in Genesis there was this single mother and her son, Hagar and Ishmael. Y'all know who they are. You might remember her story. She was the maidservant of Abraham. A single mother and a son who was put out of the, the camp twice. And the first time God appeared to her and said, go back. For I have plans for you and your son. Y'all know the story, right? If you don't, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> but Hagar goes into the desert the second time after she's put out by Sarah because she didn't want the competition of another woman with Abraham's son. And she goes into the desert and she is at a point where they have no more food, no more water, and she and her son are going to die. And she lays the boy down and she walks away. And God appears to her again and says to her, Hagar, get your son and keep on keeping on. And she gives, the messenger gives to her the same promise that was given to Abraham. I will make your descendants great. A black woman. Then there's Zipporah and her father, Jethro, in Exodus, the black wife and father-in-law of Moses. Y'all know that, right? If you didn't, you know it now. <laughs> it was Jethro who advised Moses to stop killing himself and appoint judges to try to rule this people as they journeyed in the desert. And they appointed 72 judges of the people. Then there was Ebed Melech, the Cushite. Whenever you hear the word Cush or Cushite in scripture, it means black face or dark face. And we as black people should perk up because they're talking about us. Amen? Don't say I didn't tell you. Abed Melech was the one who pulled the prophet Jeremiah out of the system. He was the one who trusted that the Lord's words to him would be fulfilled. And because of his trust and his faithfulness to the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah was told by God that he and his whole family would not die in the, in the, in the uh, persecution that was taking place and the destruction of the town, of the, of the city of Jerusalem. Then there's the prophet Zechariah, son of Cushi, a black woman, who was the prophet who foretold of the Messiah that was to come. And everybody knows about the Queen of Sheba, the woman who sought out the wisdom of Solomon, the one who coined the phrase, I am black and beautiful. Then there's Simon of Cyrene and his sons. And I like to tell this story. There's only it's only in one verse in the whole scripture. But you know, it's important for us to know and understand who he is. Why in the world was a black man chosen to carry the cross of Christ? You ever ask yourself that question? You should. 
And I like to tell it from, uh, from my perspective, with my New Orleans mentality. <laughs> See, everybody was coming to Jerusalem for the Passover. It's like everybody coming to New Orleans for the parade, you know? And the streets are filled with people. And in the midst of this Passover event, the Roman soldiers are coming down the street with three who are going to Calvary to die. And they see that Jesus the Christ is not going to make it. Now the Roman soldiers knew that they had to get somebody to carry that cross. But Jewish traditions at the time of Passover is that you can't defy yourself. So they knew they couldn't get a Jew to do this. So they chose a black man. And Simon of Cyrene had to, at that point, make a decision either to carry that cross or probably he and his whole family would have been killed on the spot. That's the story, y'all. Black faith matters. He didn't even know Jesus the Christ. But he came to know him. And he and his sons told that story when they went back home. Then there was the Ethiopian eunuch, the first baptism in the scriptures. Probably the quickest baptism in the history of the church. It was the Ethiopian eunuch, a man who had everything. He was rich, riding in the chariot, in those days, that's like riding in a Cadillac. He spoke several languages. He was reading in Hebrew, speaking in Aramaic. He was an intelligent man because he was the treasurer of the country. And even though he had all of this, he had one thing that he didn't have. He was a eunuch and he could not bear children. And he's reading the story of the Christ and the Apostle Philip comes up to him and starts explaining it to him and as they get to a water spot, he says, uh, I want to be baptized. I was baptized. You don't have to believe me, it's in Acts chapter eight, before the conversion of Paul. Then the canonized saints of our church, I'm not going to say all of them, but I've got to say some of my favorite, if you don't mind. There are three black popes who play significant roles in the development of our church. Pope St. Victor, who was pope at the time when we established the tradition of Holy Week, as we celebrate it today. Pope St. Galatius the I, who was a son of a priest, who developed the Roman Missal as we use it today in the first Eucharistic prayer that we still pray today. And then Pope Saint Matiliades, who was Pope at the time when the church became the church of the Roman Empire. Probably the most famous saints were Perpetua and Felicity, martyrs of our church two women who were pregnant at the time of their martyrdom, And even though they were killed, their children lived. Monica and Augustine, a battered wife, yet a prayerful mother, who prayed for the conversion of our son, who was truly crazy, and became a great doctor of the church. Anthony of Egypt, the father of monasticism in Northern Africa. Moses the Black, my favorite saint, a man of my dreams, because I wanted to be 6'6", and he was a big man. <laughs> but God had a different plan, I guess. But he was a thief and a marauder who fell into the hands of a group of hermits in Northern Africa 
He was so touched by their hospitality and lifestyle that he joined the monastery. He became a hermit himself, an abbot, and was later martyred for Christ. Benedict the Black, a Franciscan saint who was a cook and servant of the people, who became the leader of his community, novice director and guardian of his community. Saint Zeno, the patriot saint of Southern Italy, a black man. Then it was Saint Theus, a prostitute who locked herself in a convent and became a picture of holiness for others. Saint Alphonsus the Great, a tribal leader who converted to Catholicism and converted his whole tribal community in the Congo. Many people know about Charles Owanga and the martyrs of Uganda, Christian martyrs who refused to be submit to the evil designs of a tribal king. Martin de Porres, nurse practitioner and servant of the poor. Josephine Bakita, servant leader for Christ in the Sudan. They and many more are witnesses, not watching us as we perform. The idea is that they are examples, not onlookers. They have proven by their lives that the life of faith is the only life to live. The saints of God who show us that the God that sustained them is the same God for us. The God of yesterday is the God of today and the God of tomorrow. The first essential for running the race is faith. We must have faith to enter the race. The Christian life begins by placing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did at a blood-soaked hill called Calvary. It is through faith in his shed blood and in his resurrection that we enter the race. And we must have faith to endure in this race. Because there will be hurts. There will be hindrances. There will be hurts. Endurance is essential to those participating in the race. And endurance is key to Christian living. There will always be hurdles or obstacles to overcome. We will always run into things or peoples or circumstances that will seek to hinder, hamper, and halt us in our Christian living. To endure, faith is essential. Don't say I didn't tell you. We must have faith to be effective in this race. Whether or not you run well, our race will be dependent upon our faith in God. Faith in God will keep us going when we feel like quitting. To be effective as a believer is in this world we now live in Faith is not incidental, but essential. We need faith. Secondly, we need freedom. In the, Greek, in the Grecian Olympic Games, all bodily hindrances had to be laid aside. Likewise, heavenly runners must lay aside all weights within and or without that would impede our spiritual progress. And by discipline, 
elimination. R refer to all, to elimination, refuse to allow anything that would inhibit our running in this race. We need freedom from the weight that encumbers us. One of the greatest problems runners face is weight. A man went to the doctor with back trouble. And after examining the patient, the doctor said, you are not having back trouble. You have front trouble. What he was saying simply is, the excess weight is causing you to have problems. I'm not talking about people here in Mobile, but I know people like that. <laughs> what impedes us? The weight that could constrict us is not necessarily bad in itself. Often it is something perfectly innocent, harmless. However, it weighs us down, diverts our attention, it saps our energy, and it dampens our enthusiasm for the things of God. A winning runner does not choose between the good and the bad. No, they choose between the better and the best. The problem is not in what the weight is, but in what the weight does. It keeps us from running well. A weight is something that is even lawful at times, but yet it is not helpful for us running this race. All that does not help us hinders us. And scripture says you gotta lay it aside now lay aside, suggest something which must be thrown off like a garment. It takes discipline to be a winning runner. J. Wilbur Chamberlain once said, said it this way, my life is governed by this rule. Anything that dims my vision of Christ or takes away my taste for Bible study, or cramps my prayer life, or makes Christian work difficult, is wrong for me. And I must, as a Christian, turn away from it. Are you like that? The, weakness, the weaknesses and the wickedness that enthralls us sometimes Every weight is that which encumbers us. It is the sin that which entangles us. The weight is the unnecessary thing, and the sin is the unrighteous thing. Scripture says it besets us. It means that it places itself around us in such a way that it just holds us down and weighs us down. The sin is that which will trip us up and bind our progress. Now, obviously, all sin hurts our run, the Christian life that we're called to live. But the scripture says that, use that definitive article, the, which seems to indicate a particular sin. And if there's one particular sin that hinders our running this Christian race and living our Christian life, it is unbelief. Doubting God. Unbelief entangles the Christian's uh, feet so that he or she cannot run. It wraps itself around us so that we trip and stumble every time we try to make progress for the Lord. Isn't that true? 
Remember, unbelief was the sin that tripped up Israel and robbed a whole generation of the joys of the promised land. Unbelief arises from an unwillingness to step out upon the promises of God. Faith enables us, but unbelief tangles us. We need freedom, freedom from the witnesses that entrap us sometimes. Sometimes we can get so taken up with the witnesses and the race that they are running that we lose sight of the race that is before us. We should run the race that is set before us. We cannot run somebody else's race or we can't go to the promised land with an Egyptian mentality. Get my drip? We do not choose the course. God chooses the course we are called to run. Our race is not against each other. We are not to, com to be in competition against each other. We must be free from trying to outrun each other. That's really important for us. We must be free from attempting to run the race that was given to somebody else. Run your own race. Run it in your own lane. And stay in your own lane. We will be rewarded if we run this race that God has, has set before us and not try to run the race that he set before someone else. Thirdly, focus is required. Looking unto Jesus in running, where you look is extremely important. Nothing will throw you off your stride or slow you down than looking at your feet or the running coming behind you or the crowd in the stands. The Christian life is very much just like, like this. Our focus is so important. Note the direction of your gaze. We are not to focus on the crowd, but on our Christ. This Christian life commenced with a look to Jesus, and it will culminate with a look to Jesus. And in the in, in meantime, and in the in-between times, we should continue looking for Jesus and looking to Jesus. The Greek word for looking that is used in this scripture passage that we heard from chapter 12 in Hebrews is only used this one time. I forgot the name of the word. I, I keep forgetting uh, uh, that word, uh, that Greek word. But that word is just used that one time and it, it, it means a focused attention which shuts out all other distracting objects. While we may derive inspiration for the race from others, we imitate only one, Jesus the Christ, and only him himself. We should be constantly looking to Jesus, trustfully, submissively, hopefully, and expectantly.
The more we are looking unto Jesus, the easier it will be to lay aside every weight. It is at this point that so many fail. The more effective way, and tell me if I'm wrong, but the more effective way to get a child to drop anything that is dirty or, or injurious or some kind of object that they have in their hand that they shouldn't have in their hand is to offer him or her something better. Isn't that true? The best way to make a tired horse move more quickly is not to use the whip but to turn the horse towards home. So if our, our hearts be occupied with the sacrificial love of Christ for us, we shall be constantly, constantly looking to Jesus. And we will be constrained thereby to drop anything which displeases Christ. Note the, the, the dependence upon his grace. He is our example and our empowerment. The Greeks had a race in their Olympic Games that was quite unique. The winner was not the one, the runner, who finished first. It was the runner who finished with his torch lit. Did you know that? That's why they used the torch in the Olympic Games. I don't know about you, but I want to run all the way with the flame of my torch lit for Jesus. Let me encourage all of us to keep looking to Christ in everything that we do. There's an old fable that had that a certain dog used to be to boast frequently about his ability to outrun anything on four legs. Well, one day that dog was chasing a rabbit, but was unable to, to catch up with him. His friends chided him for his failure. Explained himself, the dog said, the rabbit was running for his life. I was only running for my dinner. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but I'm running for my life. And if anybody asks you, what's the matter with me? You could tell them, He's running for Jesus. Because I believe in that old song that says, If I can hold out, if I can keep the faith, in God's own time, my change will come. It will come. If I can do my best, if I can stand the test, in God's own time, my change will come. These old heavy burdens cannot last, oh no. These old troubles and trials soon will pass if I can just hold out if I can hold out if I can keep the faith in God's own time my change will come it will come if I can do my best, 
If I can stand the test In God's own time My change will come Hold up Just a little while longer These heavy burdens They will soon pass over Run the race Keep the faith, my change will come, my change will come. Can you sing that with me? Hold up, hold up, just a little while longer. These heavy burdens, they will soon pass over. Run the race, keep the faith. My change will come, my change will come, my change will come, my change will 